Koto Kato. Emehinui Kia Koto. Very warm welcome to our audience, uh, to those of you who are beaming in from around the country, and an extra um, special warm welcome to Dr. Tim Moore, uh, our first public health seminar speaker for the year. Uh, Dr. Moore is a senior research fellow. Uh, at the Centre for Community Child Health in Melbourne, which is based at the Royal Children's Hospital and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Um, he's also got a background as a developmental psychologist and a teacher. And I'm really delighted to have nabbed Tim uh, en route back to Melbourne via Queen Charlotte Sound. I found out that he was here for 24 hours, um, so nabbed him for the seminar. Um, I worked with Tim uh, over 10 years ago as a public health registrar um, and found um, the Centre for Community Child Health to be a really inspiring and influential place in my own understanding of human development and the public health implications of that. Um, Tim's done a huge amount of work um, in early childhood development and he's got an amazing ability to synthesise a vast uh, array of literature from different disciplines and to pull it into something really practice and policy relevant. Um, Tim's just published a report on the first thousand days of a child's life, um, and that uh, was published near the end of last year, but has got quite a movement behind it. So I'm really delighted um, to welcome Tim um, to, uh, to present to us. Uh, and I should um, note the time. Um, we're going to go for an hour today, but if some of you um, need to leave early um, at the usual time of quarter past one, that's fine. Um, but we will carry on until half, half, half past one and hopefully have time for questions. So welcome, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, this particular presentation um, is based upon the work that my colleagues and I have been doing. It's been published in that uh, document, um, which is available online in the grey literature, not in the formal literature, because it then goes straight to the people who matter, who are policy makers um, and so on. My co-authors in, in this, Nushin Arafadib, Alana Deary and Sue West. Um, the particular piece of work is funded by a project, the Strong Foundations Project, which is an alliance between the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth, which is a national group, um, Bupa Australia and the Bupa Health Foundation, so a um, in, you know, health insurance group, uh, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, that's who which is where I work, and PwC Australia, who are interested in doing some cost-effective modelling on some of this work. So an interesting group. Um, I'm going to try and finish it in 45 minutes, but there is um, enough material here to go for about three days. So it's going to be lightning fast, and what it does is tell you a story. It's a narrative about what happens in this space. Um, can I say first, the, the first thousand days is how we refer to it. Um, we tend to avoid saying the first thousand days of life because that raises the question of when does life begin and that gets us into some rather tricky ethical questions and there is no scientific answer to the question of when life begins. So, um, so we're going to look at why fo focus on the first thousand days, we're going to talk about the, the relationship between mind, brain and body, then look at three bodies of evidence that tell us about the mechanisms that underpin development in this space, then look at some factors shaping health and development, some long-term implications, implications for actions, caveats and conclusions, and run out of time. So. First thousand days is a tagline you'll be hearing a lot about. It is a, um, these are reports that were published using that tagline uh, before we published our paper. It usually um, refers to, it, most of the work that's done refers to nutrition in the first thousand days. These are books that have been published since we put our paper out. There's one, an edited book by Penelope Leach, still going strong. Um, and the second two books, First Thousand Days and the one on biology, are both solely about nutrition. 
So nutrition is a big part of the story. It's not the main focus of what we're looking at. We're looking at everything um, that... So why focus on the first thousand days? Some of the pushback we've had about this particular issue is that don't we already know the answer to this, that this is important. And when people um, uh, hear the full story, they say, no, we've learned something new here. Research in this area is rapidly advancing and our understanding of the specific mechanisms um, is more and more detailed and nuanced. Second, the new research has revealed whole aspects of the biological functioning that were not previously recognised as playing a role in development. And thirdly, it's the period of maximum developmental plasticity and therefore the period with the greatest potential to affect health and well-being over the life course. And the first thousand days refers, of course, I should have said, to the period from conception to the end of the second year. So we're not talking zero to three, we're talking conception to end of second year. Um, what, there is new evidence to support three key concepts regarding the earlier stages. There's the issue of developmental plasticity and the DOHAD hypothesis. There is social climate change and the mismatch hypothesis. There's the ecological impact, impacts on development and the social determinants. And together, they change the way we need to think about what's going on during this period. So we're going to look at each three of those. Before we do, I want to talk about the relationship between mind, brain and body. Recent accounts of early development have focused on neurological development at the expense of other aspects. So when people talk about early development, they've often talked about the architecture of the brain uh, and so on. And this way of framing early development reflects an underlying belief in the importance of the brain itself as the seat of personhood and learning. We think that's who we are. However, this fails to capture the full facts that the brain functioning is not purely cognitive, learning is not purely conscious, the brain is not purely skull-based, and the brain is co closely linked to other key bodily systems. So we get pictures of the brain that look like this or this. They're always chopped off here, um, partly for the convenience of focusing just on brain development, but it, it indicates a... Um, a sense that this is actually the most important part. The brain obviously has a brain stem. Moreover, it has a uh, peripheral nervous system. And so the brain properly is the brain and the body um, together. The brain is not purely cognitive. It's also profoundly emotional. Our emotionals directly influence the functioning of the entire brain and body from physiological regulation to abstract reasoning. It serves as a central organising process within the brain. Our ability to organise our emotions directly shapes the ability of the mind to integrate experience and adapt to future stress. Second, learning is not purely conscious. Much of our most important emotional interpersonal learning occurs during the first few years before we've developed the neurological capacities for conscious awareness. So we talk about infantile amnesia. Like we don't remember anything before a certain period because we didn't have the conscious, the cort cortical development or the language in order to describe it. So what, where is that learning? That learning is in us, it's in our bodies. Um, it it is, has a profoundly important impact on our later functioning but we cannot recall it in any kind of way. So it shapes our reactions to a whole series of things. Thus, many of the most important aspects of our lives are controlled by reflexes and behaviours and emotions learned and organised before outside our awareness and before we had um, a conscious way of, of describing it. Third, the brain is not just skull-based, but embodied. It's shaped by messages from all over the body, by the central and peripheral nervous systems. And this embodied brain shapes and is shaped by both its internal and external environment. So the brain is really a junction box, which is receiving information from inside and outside. 
The brain is not a standalone system. It's intricately connected to other major bodily systems, including anything you care to name, the immune, endocrinal, metabolic, cardiovascular, and muscular and skeletal systems, and they shape and are shaped by each other. Function as an integrated mind, brain, body system. And that means that what is learned in the prenatal first two or three years of life affects not only the neurological system, but other biological systems. So what we're talking about is a, the biological changes that occur in the first thousand days, including the neurological. Here is a picture um, of a, an immune cell talking to a, uh, a neuron in your brain. So directly communicating, and they've even illustrated the particles where, that are being exchanged between them. Um, so your immune system and your neurological system are intimately connected. Okay, here's the first of the three big bodies of knowledge um, that, we, uh, that are telling us something different about this period. We're going to talk about developmental plasticity, epigenetics, synaptic pruning and telomere effects, the developmental origins of health and disease and intergenerational transmissions in five minutes. Our, one of the most significant features of human biology is our capacity to adapt to different environments. That's why the human species is so dominant. Um, and this is the capacity known as developmental plasticity. And we obviously retain some of that throughout our lives, but it's at its greatest in the first thousand days of life and plays an important role in development from the moment of conception. And this capacity to adapt makes us versatile and vulnerable at the same time. So the changes we make might be adaptive for the immediate environment. They can come at long-term costs, both psychologically and physically. Adaptation involves a process called biological embedding, underpinned by two central mechanisms, and one of them is epi epigenetics, whereby genes listen to the environment. The other one is synaptic pruning, whereby the brain listens to the environment. In both cases, the developmental experiences and social context in which they, can, they occur can become biologically embedded, meaning they change our biology with potential lifelong impacts on health. And biological embedding also occurs at a cellular level through telomere effects. So here's the kind of book that I get to read constantly as in the process of gathering this information. This is the stuff on epigenetics. Parents change their children's health and development through genetic transmission, obviously but genes do not determine development or behavior. The way they are expressed depends upon environmental factors. And these interactions alter the expression or function of genes without altering the DNA. So it's a kind of like a dimmer switch turns on or off um, through um, epigenetic, epi of course, meaning on top of. And these epigenetic changes may be inherited we may get our genes from our parents transmitted with the uh, epigenetic marks on them so that the uh, gene is active, as it were, rather than latent. Um, even the health and physiology of parents prior to conceiving a child can affect children's health and development. Um, and while these changes may in time be rectified, in the short term, they contribute to non-genomic transmission of risk. The synaptic pruning story is a more familiar one um, to people who work in the early childhood space. It refers to what happens after birth when the neurons sprout connections, synapses, and in a huge proliferation, and that the ones that um, are not needed, not reinforced by the particular environment, then get pruned, get thinned. Um, uh, and the proximal or immediate environments in which young children spend their time play a fundamental role in deciding which synapses are pruned. So the example of that is your auditory nerve, which at birth has the capacity to distinguish between the sounds of every language on earth and progressively loses that capacity 
on the basis of just need, uh, the, it, it retains the capacity to discriminate between the sounds of the languages it hears. Children come out of the womb primed to engage with the environment and caregivers, and parents are primed to engage with them. So the baby comes out of the womb looking for the face that goes with the voice that they've listened to in the last three months of um, in the womb. And the mother's hormonal changes in the last trimester also prepare her for connection with the, uh, the infant. Learning starts from birth and learning and development are cumulative with later development building upon earlier development. And the early social experiences shape children's developing neurological and biological systems for good or ill. At the cellular level, we have the telomere story. Um, and this refers to telomeres, which are the protective caps on the end of the chromosomes on every cell in your body. Um, they're like the plastic tips on the end of shoelaces, which I think are called aglets, but I haven't had time to look it up. They play a vital role in determining our health and longevity. So you're born genetically, you have, have telomeres of a certain length. Um, which shape how long you will live. They look like this. This is a you know, um, double helix with the caps on the end. Our telomeres shorten with each division of the, our cells. And this occurs as a natural part of aging, but also in response to experiences, so toxic experiences and so on, will shorten your telomeres. And they not only shape our health span, how long we live a healthy life, but also our disease span, how long we live with disease. So you can have um, a long, healthy life with very little disease. You can have a shorter life with a whole lot of um, significant portion of your life living with disease. And um, that's the kind of effect, the shortening that you get with adverse experiences um, children, the, the, the telomere are shortened in those children who had experienced more trauma in childhood. Okay, um, the developmental origins of health and disease is a hypothesis that talks about environmental exposure such as stress or undernutrition that occurs in critical periods in the womb, having long-term life if, if, um, causing chronic disease risk by programming organs, tissues, and bodily systems, structures, or functions. There's enough evidence to support this that the people are saying, well, it's actually a paradigm now, not a, uh, a hypothesis. Um, and the way it works is that the fetus, rather than being a passive passenger in the womb, actively responds to changes within um, the environment and makes adaptations based upon the nutritional and hormonal signals crossing the placenta. If the conditions are suboptimal, these adaptations can result in permanent alteration of the structure, physiology, and metabolism of the offspring, and that lays a physiological basis for adult onset disease, such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and metabolic syndrome can also affect fertility. So the fetus is, uh, can make changes to its phenome, to, the, um, to its bodily um, shape and to its um, levels of regulation. If um, it anticipates, on the basis of the nutrition that the mother is experiencing, if it anticipates a world with limited nutrition, it will scale back the body and the metabolism. Um, uh, and if it gets it right, that's adaptive but it may have long-term consequences. If it gets wrong, um, that's damaging. If the mother is, is under a whole lot of stress during pregnancy, perhaps as a, because of being in a violent relationship, then the, the hormonal changes she experiences as a result of that are transmitted to the fetus. The fetus experiences fear in the womb. Um, and those changes alert the child to the fact that it's going to be in a, uh, a dangerous environment in which you need to be vigilant. So it alters its phenome setting like a graphic equaliser on a high fire system and comes out of the womb um, hypervigilant um, as an adaptation 
to that. Um, so as a result, adult conditions that were regarded solely as products of adult behavior and lifestyles are now seen as being linked to processes and experiences occurring decades before. And then there are preconception effects. Um, basically, the story here is that the egg and the sperm um, that are donated by the respective parents, the integrity of the egg and the sperm are shaped by the health and well-being of the parents. So we need to revise our notions of parenting, recognise that biological parenting commences well before birth, even prior to conception. So here, environmental fact, this is just f focusing simply on the, um, on, on the father before birth. There's a penis on the left, if you haven't seen one before, and that um, toxins and endocrine disruptors and can I get this word? No. smoking and obesity in the father will have an effect that will directly affect the, um, the cell and the egg as they form um, with a potential lifelong consequences. So we're now got to be thinking back to a preconception phase. Then there's the intergenerational transition story, which is the experiences of mothers or even grandmothers can be tra transmitted across generation, contribute to non-genomic transmission. When parents have been exposed to adverse um, conditions, such as Holocaust survivors in, um, from the Second World War, or we have refugees coming in who have experienced some of these things. This produces changes in their epigenome and that can be passed on to children. Most changes are stripped out in the transition by the process, but some get through. In effect, children receive genes that are in an active or switched on state. Thus the long-term consequences of adverse environmental con conditions during the first thousand days being not may not be limited to just one generation, but may lead to poor health in the generations to follow. So we have to think about going back a couple of generations, and if that's the case, we also think about going forward. We think about the grandparents of, the grandchildren of people of childbearing age now. Environments can also be passed over. In other words, the parents are, um, um, living in a particular kind of environment. It may be the environment that caused epigenetic changes that they've passed on to their children. Um, the children are raised in that same environment. Um, moreover, the, the half of their genes that they don't pa pass over are still functioning in the adults and contribute to the caregiving that they provide. So a form of what's called genetic nurture uh, uh, operates. Okay, second body of evidence. Next five minutes, social climate change and the mismatch hypothesis. So we're going to talk about social climate change and the great acceleration, evolutionary mismatch and the epidemics of non-communicable disease, mismatch conditions and the role of the microbiome. So the social climate change story is, is first of all, a climate change story about what the geologists are considering calling the Anthropocene, which is the period in which humans are the dominant factor on the functioning of the world, a planet transformed by humanity. Um, and they, uh, the, the prospective date for the beginning of the Anthropocene, 1950. That covers nearly all of us in this room. Over the last 60 years ago, so developed nations have experienced dramatic societal changes as a result of a range of interconnected factors, economic, demographic, social and technological, at globalised national and local levels. It's called the Great Acceleration. It, it uh, results from the same factors that call climate change and constitutes a form of social climate change. And the entire experience of almost everyone now living has taken place in this eccentric historical moment, the most anomalous and unrepresented representative period in, our, in the history of relations between our species and the biosphere, and it can't last. Social climate change has a number of effects. It's dramatically altered the conditions under which families are raising young kids. 
That's tremendously important. It's altered the nature of the problems facing society and governments. They're now more likely to be complex or wicked problems uh, instead of easy to solve problems. And it's altered the nature of the health problems that we, challenges that we are facing. Uh, these now take the form of chronic non-communicable diseases rather than the acute conditions that we previously faced and that were by and large um, successfully addressed through 20th century medicine advances and improvements in sanitation and the like. Fourth, while most people have benefited greatly, the benefits have not been shared equally. And fifth, while many of the changes have been highly beneficial, some have unintended side effects which are damaging our health and well-being, And in particular, we have this notion of mismatch. And the basic story here is that thanks to the genes we inherited, we're adapted in varying extents for certain activities, foods, climatic conditions, and other aspects of your environment. We're talking hunter-gatherer environments. At the same time, because of changes in our environments, we are sometimes, but not always, inadequately or poorly adapted for other activities, such as the ones we now experience. And these maladaptive responses can sometimes, but not always, make us sick. And there are a whole lot of mismatch diseases that are caused by environmental changes that alter how the body functions. Um, uh, so the, the, the key to this story is that we have changed the world in ways that do not fit our evolutionary body. Our evolutionary bodies require certain kinds of inputs to develop um, successfully and our modern environments don't provide them. We've built a world that no longer fits our bodies, our genes um, uh, limit our capacity to adapt. There's a mismatch. We're seeing the impact of this mismatch in the explosion of diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. Uh, but it's got other consequences. Here's the longest list I've found of potential mismatch diseases. There are psychological ones, neurological ones, endocrinological, including metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular ones, reproductive ones, immunological, the asthma and the allergies, um, skin, sleep, gut and bowel, including irritable bowel syndrome, dietary, dental, um, musculoskeletal, sight, and um, toxins, and so on. That is a whacking great list. Um, now, not all, I should say that these are um, connections, hypothetical connections. It means that the mismatch conditions are contributing to these things, not totally causing lots of other things that contribute to these things as well. Some mismatch diseases result from too much of a formerly rare stimulus such as sugar, um, which the Australian government is now pressure in Australia to tax, as has happened in other countries, so the government is rejecting that. Others result from too little of a formerly common um, stimulus. We evolve to use it or lose it. Because our bodies are not engineered, but instead grow and evolve, your body expects and requires certain stresses when you're maturing to develop appropriately. And many mismatch diseases occur when growing bodies fail to experience as much stress as evolution geared them to express. Basically, we've blanded out our environment. So we removed the fiber and the fermented foods from our diets. We've moved hot and cold from our environments. We've removed the need for exercise or for lifting things. Um, and all of these things are stresses that we actually need. Um, we've removed feast and famine. Our bodies are not designed to eat all the time, be able to eat at any time. So, um, so all of these things, we just, we've, we've removed all the fibre from our lives, and yet we need those kinds of uh, that fiber in our lives for um, healthy development. Necessary stresses may be neurological, musculoskeletal, immunological, dietary, and metabolic. If a kid plays tennis solidly in their childhood, they will end up with the, the bone in their striking arm twice as thick as the bone in the other arm. Um, you, you need to exercise in order to build a healthy body. Um, we've created environments that deprive us of many of the necessary stresses during development. 
Um, in, in the first thousand days space, um, two key non-communicable diseases that are mismatched conditions are allergies and obesity, both of them inflammatory conditions. And we're familiar with the, uh, um, the, the thing about the, the allergies is that the first thousand days is a critical time for immune development and allergy prevention. And during pregnancy, there are various maternal e exposures that are associated with changes in the pattern of the fetal immune responses, including microbial exposures, infections and so on, dietary nutrients and environmental pollutants. And in infancy, we've got um, cleaner environments, trying to, to um, remove every bacteria in sight, a futile exercise, but we still take too many out, declining exposure to infectious agents, modern diets and exposure to pollutants again. Obesity, well, we're familiar with this story as well. Um, even the total number of fat cells in our body are determined in early life. Prenatal influences include mother's smoking habits, mother's weight gain, mother's blood sugar levels. Postnatal include um, uh, how rapidly the infant gains weight, initiation and length of breastfeeding, the duration of infant sleep contributes to um, obesity. Allergies and obesity reinforce one another. Childhood obesity increasing the risk, increases the risk of food allergies, while allergic inflammation impacts metabolism and therefore increases the risk of obesity. Then there's the microbiome, and this is a new part of our story. And this tells us that mismatch diseases can also result from the impact that changed living conditions have had on the human microbiome, not only just on us, but on the vast numbers of bacteria, viruses, and fungi that live on and in the human body and play an important role in maintaining our health and well being. They have co evolved with us over millennia and they provide us with essential services in exchange for being housed and fed. So some of the goodness in breast milk um, can only be extracted by the bacteria in our stomach and um, passed on to the fetus. Some of the stuff in breast milk is only used by bacteria and not by us. So there's a mutual um, uh, coexistence that goes on there. Uh, and the, the issue here is if we mess around with the microbiome, if we alter its composition, if we don't establish it healthy early on, that can have health consequences. Any change in the abundance or composition or diversity can have significant health consequences. Um, this kind of disturbances known as dysbiosis can take several forms. There's loss of the beneficial microbes, expansion of harmful microbes, loss of overall microbial diversity, all can be affected by modern living conditions. Then there turns out to be another link in this mind-brain-body connection, which says it's a mind-brain-body microbiome connection. Now, we really ought to be thinking about ourselves and our microbiome as being one, as being a kind of superorganism. So the mind, gut, and microbiome talk to one another. They're in constant communication. Um, another way in which the brain is distributed is you, you have an enteric brain. So if we took your gut and spread it out, it would be the size of a basketball court and studded with neurons. And those neurons are able to communicate through the uh, stomach wall with bacteria. And there is a communication that goes up the vagus nerve and down, back down the vagus nerve that affects our mood and our appetite. And our moods and our appetite affect the composition of microbiota in our gut. Traffic is two-way. Our mental states can shape the composition of our gut bacteria. Our gut bacteria can affect, in turn affect our moods, our choices, our overall health. And the first thousand days of life are particularly crucial in shaping the architecture of this access. Both the brain and the microbiome are still developing, developing and changes tend to persist for life. Acquiring a full complement of microbiota is central. This is the self-completion hypothesis. You get your first smear of microbiota as far as we know as you come out the birth canal. Um, 
if you and you are then placed on your mother's body rather than taken away and being cleaned up, you get more and you build up your own unique um, quota, your microbiome that on your body and in your body during that time, it's stabilized by the time you're at the end of the um, first thousand days period. And we all have a unique microbiome. Um, there appears to be a narrow developmental window for effective seeding surrounding birth. Um, Caesarean sections complicate the story, make it harder to um, get the um, quite, I'll come back. The completion of the full microbiome um, shapes the gut microbiome for life. Um, we damage the, potentially the composition of the microbiome through overuse of antibiotics in prescribing them to very young children um, or in the use of antibiotics in, as, um, in raising the food that we eat, um, you know, the pigs and cattle and the like. Caesarean section births, formula feeding, poor nutrition, excessive sanitation practices. Okay, third of our big bodies of evidence, ecological impacts on development and social determinants. We're gonna look at social determinants, social gradients, the role of poverty, uh, might skip the Aboriginal, no, probably relevant for the Maori population. Social determinants, this is the big story about, this is uh, Michael Marmot is the great champion of this and it's been on the agenda for a while. Our health and broader life outcomes are strongly shaped by the social, economic and environmental conditions in which we are born, grow, live and age. And there are social gradient effects such that the lower one standing in life, the worse our health and other outcomes are likely to be. And that's not just disparities between the rich and the poor, it occurs at every step along the way. That someone who is marginally better off than you is more likely to be marginally live longer or in a more healthy way. These differences are independent of access to healthcare. Healthcare makes a difference, but the, the gradient effect exists without healthcare. So it's not as if the um, the, the well-off people who live longer have access to better health care. Uh, that's a potent story that we need to take time to absorb. These are the books on the social determinants of health. Um, that third one, Michael Marmot, The Health Gap, but um, is, uh, he's the one who's been championing this story. The conditions under which people live their lives are the main influences on their health. That's a salutary um, story because it's telling us that, that medical interventions or other interventions are not the main determinants. Good conditions of daily life are things that really count are unequally distributed. And that means that um, the chances that health is unequally distributed. Being at the wrong end of society is profoundly disempowering and that has profound effects for all sorts of things, and the effect is graded. Poverty is obviously a major concern. It's obviously a major concern here. It's being made a major concern by your Prime Minister, who has adopted the position of Minister for Poverty and, and says that she came into Parliament because of poverty and wants to eradicate um, child pot of poverty or harvest. it. Um, exposure to sustain poverty in the first thousand days is associated with adverse health and social outcomes, um, including physical health, social and emotional well-being, cognitive, etc. It's got a cumulative uh, negative impact, um, and it's less damaging later on. It's most damaged during this period. So, and we've got evidence that if you can relieve poverty in this time, you can. Uh, but, uh, that will result in benefits like increased birth weight and other outcomes, which will contribute to reduced um, risk of negative outcomes in later life. Um, look, I might skip that because of, uh, because of the time constraints. Um, our paper also looks at a series of specific factors, which we will not be going through except to show you what they are. Child characteristics such as the notion of developmental susceptibility and temperamental differences. Parental family characteristics, family structure, 
family relationships. This is the story about nurturing and the story about child abuse um, and the like. Community environments turn out to be important. The importance of support networks for parents. Physical environments are also important. The quality of the neighbourhood, uh, access to natural environments. Um, exposure to environmental toxins is a big story that we have hardly got a handle on at all. Um, the toxins we're exposed to are not the um, industrial or agricultural ones, they're the ones that are used to clean this theatre and the fire retardants in the seats you are sitting on uh, that do the damage. Um, and um, they are all tested on adults and not on um, neurologically immature infants and so on. So we really don't, don't know what's going on there. Nutrition is a huge story. I mentioned it at the beginning, um, adequate nutrition for parents before conceiving, during pregnancy, after pregnancy and for the infant throughout is tremendously important. Substance abuse and so on, we are familiar with that story, the impact of tobacco and smoking and drugs, etc. Stress is a big um, thing that we need to be sparing people from and adverse childhood experiences which accumulate. So how long does this stuff last? This is the, the key question because the story we've presented so far is um, scary. There's a huge number of things that can go wrong. Um, so is what happens in the first thousand days fix us for good? Um, development's not a simple process where an exposure or an experience at any one point will lead directly to a developmental outcome at a later point. Doesn't work like that. Development is always contextual. It's always shaped by environmental experiences and exposures and continues to be so after the first thousand days. It's transactional in which the child shapes as well as shaped by the environment and it's multi-determined so that if you look at any adverse health outcome later and say what are the factors that might have contributed to that you can point to you know half a dozen major contributors um, if you look at any single major contributor it could contribute to a whole series of different outcomes so it's a complex relationship beyond the first thousand days children and young people's ongoing development are shaped by a combination of three processes biological embedding which is the what we've talked about, it continues to occur throughout life. Biological embedding continues to um, occur, but to a lesser um, extent. Um, accumulation effects, if you keep having positive experiences or if you keep having negative experiences, um, then you will get an accumulation of the changes that have occurred in you. And then there are developmental escalations of risk over time. One risk leads to another. And um, uh, these pathways are not mutually exclusive. So how long, how long lasting are the effects? While the first thousand days is the period of greatest development, developmental plasticity, it doesn't end there, continues to play a role in our ongoing development and functioning throughout our lives. And these changes can be for better or worse. The effects of early adverse experiences can be ameliorated through exposure to safer, more responsive and more stimulating environments. And a positive start to life may be compromised if later social physical environments are less positive. So good early experiences are not an inoculation. Our ongoing development means that epigenetic changes can be modified. So those marks on the genes can be um, eased off, if you like, through sustained positive experiences. Telomere loss can be restored. You can restore loss. You can't increase the amount of telomeres that you are ever given, but you can um, restore the loss after changes. And, and the, the book on telomeres I showed you before by Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for her work in this area, um, uh, has at the back an, a telomere manifesto which makes interesting reading. However, the degree of plasticity after the first thousand days is reduced. It takes stronger and more sustained environmental experiences to change us. 
Uh, adolescence is the other great period of developmental plasticity, not as um, uh, profound as uh, or as widely re wide reaching as the changes that occur in infancy in the first thousand days, but nevertheless an important period. Some biological changes may not be reversible, and I haven't really got my head around all of this stuff yet. But there are some things that um, occur in the womb, uh, and at the point you're born, you cannot get any more of. Um, this, is, this is the thing. Um, and I haven't got a, a definitive list of that. Susan Prescott, um, a, an Australian paediatrician, this is a good book called Origins. Um, if we have fewer nephrons in our kidneys, if we have fewer islet cells in our pancreas, if our peak bone density is low, if we have fewer, fewer neuronal synapses, our reserves will be lower. And some of these things are fixed at the point at which we are born. Um, so we need to be concerned then about that, um, that period of pregnancy. Implications for actions. There are three distinct developmental periods. Our, our paper doesn't deal with epidemiology and it doesn't deal with efficacy of outcomes. We have a bit that I'm about to show you on Im implications and in taking this around our country at this stage uh, and here, our question is to you and to anyone we show it to, okay, what do you make of this? What should we be doing in the light of this information? Uh, and we will be progressively unpacking that kind of story. Um, there are three distinct developmental periods when we might think about what we should be doing. Preconception, so the notion of preconception and interconception care uh, is now on the radar. Pregnancy, um, if pregnancy is such a critical period, are our current antenatal processes sufficient? Are we paying attention to all the things that impact on it? Infancy, we're better, we're more secure there, but how strong are we at supporting people in that first um, two years, in that very vulnerable period uh, in infancy? Um, the effects of, um, looking at research yesterday that said effects of maternal depression can be shown on the children, um, you know, decades later. Um, so these are important things. We need to be thinking about a, a life course approach, which you might call a cradle to cradle approach. This is a diabetes um, way of thinking that DM is the diabetes mellitus life course approach. You see that circle up the top, which goes infants and childhood, adolescence, pregnancy, potential adult life. We've got to think about all of those things. We've got to think at cradle to cradle and onto the next generation as a way of thinking about um, these things. We can, another way of approaching it is to think about what we can do at a cellular level. So there's the telomere manifesto, what we can do for our, um, for, to benefit our telomeres. Um, we can think about microbiome health. How do we focus on that as, as um, something we ought to be doing? Nutritional health is obviously important. Environmental health, how to prevent exposure to environmental toxins. Relational health, how do we build the relations with uh, positive relations with caregivers, etc. Another way of thinking about it comes uh, uh, Daniel Lieberman, who's the champion of mismatch idea, says, well, there are four things that we could do. We can let natural selection sort the problem out. Um, not likely, except I'm just, just um, reading a book by a Dutch ecologist who is documenting all the myriad ways in which flora and fauna have evolved rapidly to adapt to urban environments. So not totally out of the question, perhaps. Invest in more biomedical research and treatment, absolutely. But the people who are working in this space say, don't expect any results soon. What have we got so far? We've got CRISPR or whatever the gene editing technique is, which people are excited about. But nobody who knows anything about telomeres knows how to intervene at the telomere level. If you look at the telomere manifesto, it says, um, eat well, sleep well, have a good friendship group, exercise well, think positive thoughts. Not saying anything about um, you know, how, you, how you actually do, deal with anything. It's just what 
you, you've got to make sure that what impacts upon that your telomeres is, is positive. Educate and empower. This is your bag. This is the public health message. This is public health that needs to get out there to um, the general public and to all practitioners. And there's a big training agenda in this as well. Change the environment I want to talk about. And a fifth course of action, of course, that, that Lieberman doesn't mention is improved provision of services. Um, uh, so educate and empower, provide people with useful, credible information about the factors that impact on early child development and well-being and what they need to do. Um, and so with this new information, how do we change the public health messages and how do we get them out there? Provide training to service providers. Improve services. This is the default approach adopted by governments and service providers. That's the lever they've got hold of, so that's the one they use. And that'll continue to play an important role. But if the conditions under which families are raising young kids are actually more important than services, then maybe we need to think differently about this. Relying solely on targeted health and other services has not been sufficient so far to make a difference. Um, so we may need to think about changing the environment. Since all diseases result from gene environment interactions and we can't re-engineer our genes, or perhaps we can, the most effective way to prevent mismatch is to re-engineer our environments. We need to look at the causes of the causes. We need to pay attention to the conditions under which families are raising young kids. I'm skipping this in the interests of getting to the caveats. Um, science doesn't speak for itself always has to be interpreted. What I presented to you is an interpretation of the evidence. This is a story, this is a narrative about us. It turns out to not just be about first thousand days at all, it's about how society functions and what kind of society we want to be. We must be aware of pragmatic reductionism, that is, if we seek to frame the evidence for the benefits of policymakers and practitioners, such as the Prime Minister, there's a danger we might reduce the evidence too far and present as proven findings still being debated. Science is never settled. Our narrative is therefore necessarily provisional, not definitive. We must be aware of determinism and blame. This is not a blame parents or even grandparents story. Um, it's, not, it's not deterministic in the sense of saying these early experiences determine what happens. They, they, it shapes, they contribute to. They're not final in any sense. And uh, we must be aware of making people feeling guilty about any of this. The interpretation of the findings we produce could be used to justify a wide range of policies. And there are now books coming out describing some of the dangerous ways in which it could be interpreted. So we need what we're into is an ethical um, analysis of the implications of this. Last slide. The dramatic changes that have occurred in our societies over the past half a century have affected the conditions under which families are raising young kids and therefore their developmental and health outcomes. While some of these changes are for the better, not all of the benefits have been equally distributed and some of the changes appear not to be beneficial at all. Our task is to understand the mechanisms that underpin development, learn how these can be disrupted by adverse experiences and exposures, identify the environmental changes that are having these adverse effects so that we can address them. Our first thousand days evidence paper is a progress report on where we've got to with that task. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tim, for a phenomenal presentation that just covers such a vast area of work. Um, and, and pulling that together um, in such a compelling way um, has been really, really powerful. I might... Um, throw uh, the floor open for questions. Um, Tim's left us with a challenge on what we're going to do about this, uh, so feel free. Yeah, questions or comments? We've got five minutes.
Um, how have you been finding ways to get this information out to the public without having families feel the blame on that? Have you found a way to kind of navigate those conversations? So this, how to get the message out? Without families, like parents, feeling like that they uh, are to blame. Well, how do we get any message out without alarming them? There's already, you know, a huge amount out there that people don't know how to process. You know, what should you eat and what should you drink and so on. And um, a lot of it can be very alarmist. So, you know, all we're saying, this is, this is we now know more, we've got a, a better, and so we've got to find a way of framing these messages in a way which doesn't alarm and doesn't make people, people uh, blame. So that's, that's a, um, you know, that's, that's a challenge for the, um, the public health field. Um, you know, how do you, what, what do we know about how do we frame messages in ways which will change people's behaviour um, but without making them feel ultra anxious about things? Um, there's, a, there, there's a lot that we've got to learn in that space. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, a very good presentation. But I have a question relating to public education. The evidence in other areas is that the education approach is mostly taken up by better educated and more affluent people, and therefore you'll probably increase the disparities. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, yes, that, that is what happens. The people who are best educated hear and understand the story and act on it. And, uh, um, uh, uh, but, the, you know, what are we going to do? Not So that may mean that we need ways in which we um, are able to do some specific targeting of the message. Uh, the, the, there, there are different ways in which this whole thing can be framed different routes through which the information can reach people. The ways in which we take in information and modify our behaviour are different from the ways that people in different groups take it in. So we have to find ways to reach those other people so that they um, improve their behaviour. There isn't, there isn't a single answer to your, your dilemma. It's a real one. Nikki. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's, oh. Thank you for your rich presentation. I guess my question is about relative attribution. There's a whole range of physical, social, emotional, environmental issues. Um, if you're trying to put them together in any sort of policy format for, for progress, how would you start looking at relative attribution? What is more important than others? What could you leave to one side? You know, how would you stage your planning rather than saying you want to do all things yeah. for all people at all times? Yeah. Um, well, it's a fair question. It's one of the ones that we're, we are um, obviously grappling with. Um, my answer to that is um, that we need to actually engage everyone who has a capacity to influence um, the conditions under which families are raising young kids in a discussion, in a thinking about the impact that they're um, planning. For instance, um, housing is an issue, Tra uh, transport is an issue, um, poverty is an issue. Um, so how do we get a, uh, as it were, a first thousand days in everything policy going? Um, so we need all, we need to bring together a, um, uh, so that there is action being taken on all those fronts at once, because all of them contribute. All of them are producing the effects um, that we are having. Um, can, can we start in specific ways? Are, are there some things that are more likely to um, have an effect than others? Uh, I think there are. We have to agree what they are. But I would certainly be starting with looking at the social networks uh, and so on that um, uh, new mothers have to support them in their parenting or that pregnant mothers have that support them in their parenting since social networks are a potent source of thing. So this is different from, from trying to say, well, we're going to educate you or we're going to train you, we're going to target you in some kind of way. It's the conditions under which they live, the social conditions. So that means getting local governments involved and thinking about the... Um, the access to green spaces, the 
navigability of roads, creating places where families with young kids or people who are, people who are pregnant can go and make contacts with other people. In Australia, at least, we don't have places like that. So that would, that would be a starting point. Uh, there are lots of other places that you can start. We need to, I think that part of the answer lies in this business of um, mobilising a whole range of people. Um, you know, do the town planners. In Melbourne, we have areas um, where Melbourne is going to increase from 4 million to 7 million in five minutes flat kind of thing. And um, so the question is when they're out in, um, in, a, in a growth corridor area and they're building a new um, suburb, what should it look like? When you think about the first thousand days, what factors would you take into account? I think there's a whole lot in our paper that, that, that has implications in those situations. So it's, we've got to unpack them and find out what a town planner might need to think about. It's just one example. Thank you, Tim. Sadly, we have run out of time. Um, but thank you so much for that presentation and you've given us so much food for thought and a challenge for all of us to see what we can do to advance the first thousand days and all policies approach, which I really, really love. Um, so thank you again uh, to our audience and to those um, online for joining us. Um, and if you can join with me to thank Tim. Thank you.